70s, a sadistic husband and wife team stalked the American West. He would shoot some, he would use hammers to bludgeon them to death, every diabolical method. She was the coldest stone cold killer. Their mission, deviant and depraved. The original plan was sex slaves. Total domination of someone else, to just brutalize, that is what is arousing. What motivated this match made in hell? I thought he was nuts. I thought he was crazy. He's always been that way. She thought, hey, this is a sweet guy. And were they born to kill? I don't think they're sick. I think they're evil. In the late 1970s, California's capital city was a quiet town, notable for its proximity to more famous attractions. Sacramento is really kind of a location that's in between every place else. It's close to the San Francisco. It's not far from the Sierras and the snow. But Sacramento is kind of like a, a little sleepy river town at the time. There was very little crime, really, at that time. But Sacramento's residents didn't realize that evil lurked among them. And in November of 1980, it was about to show its face. I was working a weekend shift. And uh, I got a call from the radio sergeant that said they had some people concerned about uh, uh, one of their friends that had disappeared at a party. 21-year-old college student, Mary Beth Sowers, and her 22-year-old fiancé, Craig Miller, had been attending a celebration at a restaurant in the city. The party was about Founders Day. It was a Founders Day dance and party. And uh, they were here most of the evening. And they were leaving here around midnight or so. They were coming out of the, the carousel lounge. It was a fraternity function. They were in their formals. The kids were coming out of the parking lot right here. Their friend Andy had witnessed their bizarre disappearance. Andy told us that he walked out after Craig and Mary Beth had left the restaurant. And as they were walking through the parking lot, they saw Craig and Mary Beth sitting in the back seat of this blue car. Andy says to his date, watch this. And he climbs in behind the wheel. Uh, OK, where are we going? And Craig says, Andy, this is no place for you to be. As he st started to get out of the car, this little blonde female, tiny petite thing, came running around from the other side of the car, screaming at him. She slapped Andy and told him to get out of her car. Slapped him, got in the car, and they sped off. He had enough sense to jot the license number down on the car. Their friends were worried. Andy didn't recognize the car, nor the petite blonde driver. And Mary Beth and Craig were not the type to behave so strangely. Mary Beth, she's daddy's little girl. Real ray of sunshine, smart as a whip. Loved everybody, loved to dance, loved to sing. Wonderful. She was very pretty. When I met her, she was 17 years old, but she was going on 25. She didn't dress like the rest of us. We were kind of, you know, jeans and t-shirts and that sort of thing. But Mary Beth was always dressed up like, like a businesswoman. Mary Beth had enrolled in Sacramento State University. Excellent student, good in math, good in foreign languages. One of the math teachers said, Mary Beth, let me teach the class, if it's okay by you. That's the kind of student she she was. There, Mary Beth had been swept off her feet by fellow student Craig Miller. 
She met Craig because she was in a sorority and she met him at one of the sorority fraternity dances. He was a nice guy, he really was. The couple's friends were alarmed by their uncharacteristic disappearance. Mary Beth, she was very responsible. I was the careless one, you know? I was, I could have been the one that would gotten myself in a precarious situation. Not Mary Beth. Investigators took their fears seriously. We dropped everything what we were doing, started running on the license plates. The vehicle was registered in an affluent Sacramento suburb to a businessman and his 23-year-old daughter, Charlene Gallego. Detective Burchett visited the family house to question them, but was told that neither Charlene nor her husband, Gerald, were there. That's when Gerald and Charlene pulled up into the back. Gerald immediately said, I got to go, and so Gerald left. At Detective Burchett's request, the heavily pregnant Charlene voluntarily showed him the car in question. I came out right here in the driveway, and that's where she gave me the keys and let me search the uh, car. Couldn't find anything that indicated anything foul had occurred there. And then she got sick, she got ill, and she told me that she was pregnant and she had morning sickness and she couldn't talk anymore. And so at that time, we didn't have much to go on. Uh, so she uh, uh, had her commit that she would come down and talk to us later. And uh, me and the uh, other detective left the house thinking that we we're going to make contact with them later. Despite what Craig and Mary Beth's friends had witnessed outside the party, Charlene Gallego seemed unlikely to be involved in anything suspicious. Charlene was raised in a relatively fluent uh, home, uh, mother and father, uh, only child, educated. Her dad was in the supermarket business. She was always pretty taken care of. She was pampered. She was daddy's little girl. She lived in a nice area of Sacramento called Arden Park. She had attended Rio Americana High School, which was a good school. She had participated in school activities that included uh, the playing violin and the school orchestra. She seemed perfectly normal. She, uh, she just acted like she was tired and really didn't want to be a part of this, but she was letting me do whatever I needed to do. But Charlene Gallego held a dark secret, which when revealed would send shockwaves across three Western states. In November 1980, Sacramento college students Craig Miller and Mary Beth Sowers disappeared from outside a fraternity party. Witnesses had seen them in a strange vehicle, which had been traced to 23-year-old Charlene Gallego. After agreeing to come to the police station for further questioning, Charlene had failed to show. Detective Jean Burchett went back to Charlene's family home. So we were spotting in the house when the parents returned home. And so we went in the house and we were talking to them about this is pretty serious now, so something's going on, what can you tell us? And while I was there at the house, we received a radio call from El Dorado County Sheriff's Office. And that's when the complexion of the investigation changed. I think this is the spot. This is the site where Craig was dumped. El Dorado County found him face down or in the dirt here, shot several times in the head. He was uh, dressed nicely in uh, his suit, but had no shoes on. And he was just uh, left lying there in the dirt. Charlene and her husband, Gerald, were now the prime suspects in a murder case. And investigators immediately found an address for an apartment Gerald rented. I had no idea what to expect as we were driving out of the apartment. We were hoping he was there because we wanted to talk to him. This looks familiar. There it is, that was his place right there. Neither Gerald nor Charlene were home. We searched their house in detail. 
It was almost like a prison cell. It was clean. Everything was in order. Remember, there was a gold pan sitting on the shelf. There was bullets and guns all laid out. It looked like he was ready for inspection. Very neat and tidy. It was spotless, just like the car. We found guns and ammunition, and yeah, but nothing really that could connect it to Craig or Mary Beth. Charlene's husband, Gerald Gallego, didn't share the same privileged background as his wife. He'd grown up just north of Sacramento, in the small rural town of Chico. Gerald Gallego did not have an abusive childhood. He had a brutal childhood. It was just very, very difficult. Gerald's mother, in her younger days, I think she was kind of wild. She had a lot of boyfriends, brought a lot of men home. Gerald had to deal with a lot of abuse from Henri, bad men. But it was the boy's father, Gerald Gallego Sr., who set the benchmark for bad behavior. Gerald came from probably the most dysfunctional family you could describe. His own father was a murderer. Imprisoned in Mississippi for stealing a car, he vowed to kill the next cop that tried to arrest him. In 1954, Gerald Gallego Sr. took a prison guard hostage and escaped. After spending a day on the run, he then shot the jailer in the head. He was arrested and convicted and sentenced and executed while Gerald is growing up here in California. To have his father removed so violently from the world and from his life with no hope of ever knowing this man and also being identified as the child of a executed murderer would, would have a serious effect on who he thinks he is. By his mid-teens, Gerald and his brothers were firmly entrenched in the family business. They got into robberies, they got into a sniffing uh, a lighter fluid, they, get in, they got involved in anything they can to, to make a nickel. And soon their misdemeanors drew the attention of the law. When he was 14 years old, Gerald, his brother, had got in a car chase with police and was involved in a shootout. Bullets were coming through the back seat of where Gerald was hiding. Gerald and his brother David were true righteous outlaws. Tempted by the opportunities of the big city, the brothers headed south to the Oak Park area of Sacramento. I knew Gerald, uh, he lived in Oak Park, and that's where I grew up at. I thought he was nuts. I thought he was crazy. He's always been that way. They always had guns, you know, wherever they was and whatever they're doing, there was always robberies and there was always guns in the picture. He was what you might call in the old days a riverboat gambler, making his way through life, cheating other people and whenever the opportunity came, committing crimes here and there to live. Now, Gerald appeared to be connected with a case of abduction and murder. Attention immediately turned to the whereabouts of Mary Beth. Her boyfriend was found murdered, but she was still missing. So yeah, I was, I was pretty freaked out. Almost on a daily basis, Mr. Sowers would call me and want to know what I've done to find his daughter. And it was so hard to tell him I haven't found her and I don't know what happened. Detectives were, however, convinced of Gerald and Charlene Gallego's involvement in Mary Beth's abduction and the death of Craig Miller, but had little evidence to tie them in. This is kind of a roughneck bar called the Bob Les Club, and uh, Gerald worked here as a bartender. This was Gerald's lifestyle, drinking, bars, and women. He felt real comfortable here. We got a call from a... Uh, a female that was in the bar, she said he was showing off. He fired, uh, fired a little gun up into the ceiling to get people's attention. And so I went up uh, in the attic, and we could see the light. And I started digging around, and I found the slugs embedded in the ceiling. Sent them to the lab, and they matched them to the bullets taken from the scene of Craig. The bullets were hard evidence connecting Gerald to the murder.